Hello there, welcome back to Jenny Designs with Paper and this week's episode of Crime and Coloring, where we take an alphabetical journey through the United States and revisit some of the earliest crimes. But before we talk crime, let's talk coloring. This week I am coloring a digital stamp. I purchased it on Etsy and I will link that down below in the description box. I'm using this Cartabella paper pad and I'm using the color pad, the colors in this paper pad. I will be coloring with Copic markers and our story is long, so we're going to jump on into it. Our alphabetical journey today takes us to the state of Wyoming. This is the last stop on our journey. The United States acquired the area of Wyoming multiple times, first from the French as part of the Louisiana Purchase, then from Great Britain as part of a treaty in 1846, and some of the area even came from territory ceded by Mexico in 1848. The Wyoming Territory was made up of parts of the Dakota, Idaho, and Utah Territories on July 25, 1868, and is about the same boundaries as we have today. The region was named Wyoming in a bill introduced to Congress in 1865, which provided a temporary government for the Territory of Wyoming. It had been used earlier by colonists and is derived from the Lenape language meaning at the Big River Flat. Bills for Wyoming Territory's admission to the Union were introduced in both the House and the Senate in December of 1889 and on March 27, 1890 the House passed the bill and President Benjamin Harrison signed it making Wyoming, Wyoming wow, the 44th state in the Union. Now, some couple interesting things about Wyoming is that it is the home of Old Faithful, and Old Faithful erupts regularly. Most of Yellowstone National Park is in Wyoming, and President Theodore Roosevelt loved Yellowstone. The painter Jackson Pollock is from Wyoming, and yay for Wyoming, it is the first state where women could vote. In Wyoming, it is bad if your hat obstructs other people's view. The green hair streak butterfly signals spring has arrived. There are only two escalators. Now, I did not fact check that, but it seemed kind of weird enough to throw in here. Wyoming has one of the oldest fairs. Almost half the state is federally owned. There are islands in Wyoming. The Black Hills are green in reality. And Wyoming became the home and the death place of a famous killer for hire. Now, Thomas Horn Jr., known as Tom, was born in 1860 to his parents, Tom Sr. and Mary Ann Horn. They lived on a family farm in rural northeast Missouri. The fam um, family owned about 600 acres that was cut into two pieces by the South Wyaconda River. Tom was the tw fifth of 12 children, and during his childhood, young Tom suffered physical abuse from his father, and his only companion as a child was a dog named Shedrick. The dog was tragically killed when young Tom got into a fight with two boys who beat him up and then killed the dog. Because his home was an, home life rather was an unhappy one, by the time he was 14 years old, he ran away. He made his way first to Santa Fe, New Mexico, and then by the age of 16, he was in Arizona. When Tom arrived in the American Southwest, he was hired by the U.S. Calvary as a civilian scout, packer, and interpreter. He did a good job and rose in rank, through, rose up through the ranks, rather. He also became known as a crack shot. He was often able to sneak past enemy lines and save his army company from attack. Tom was a respected scout known for going out alone in reconnaissance missions. By November of 1885, Tom had earned the position as Chief of Scouts under Captain Emmett Crawford at Fort Bowie. Now, being a crack shot wasn't all that Tom was becoming known for. Tom's ability to shoot accurately and at a distance came into play during a duel. He allegedly killed a man as a result of a dispute over a prostitute from a greater than average distance. Now, once the war was complete, Tom used, or once his time in the army was complete, Tom used the money he had saved to build a ranch. So he returned to Arizona and bought 100 cattle and 26 horses and a claim in the Deer Creek Mining District. However, his life as a rancher was short-lived 
when cattle thieves stormed his ranch one night and stole all of his stock. This caused Tom to become bankrupt. And that incident marked the start of Tom's hatred for, and disdain for thieves. And it, and it was the beginning of a new profession for him, the profession of range detective. Now, after his bankruptcy, Tom wandered and took many jobs. He was a prospector, he was a ranch hand, he was a rodeo cont contestant, but he became notor no notorious, wow, words are hard, notorious for being hired by cattle companies as a cowboy and hired gun to watch over their cattle and kill suspected rustlers. Tom had his own method of dealing with rustling or rustlers he would um, basically steal the cattle back. He claimed that he could go in and take the cow or the cattle back, and that was easier and more reliable than getting the courts involved in the theft. Tom was also known for giving wrestlers a warning. He was um, had a reputation of being a, quote, tremendous president presence. Wow, that was terrible tremendous presence whenever he was in an area and if he thought somebody was guilty of stealing cattle he would warn them and if the theft continued after the warning tom would shoot the thief and he was quoted as saying he did not feel one shred of remorse and there was a rancher named fergie mitchell on the north laramie river and he described tom's reputation as quote i saw him ride by he didn't stop, but went straight up the creek in plain sight of everyone. All he wanted was to be seen, and his reputation was so great that his presence in the community had the desired effect. Within a week, three settlers in the neighborhood sold their holdings and moved out. And that was the end of rustling on the North Laramie. So Tom must have been a big man and a scary man, and he had a reputation. Now, later, Tom took part in the Pleasant Valley War between cattlemen and sheepmen in Arizona, although historians haven't really established which side he worked for. Tom also served as a deputy under three famous Arizona lawmen, and during his time as a deputy sheriff, he drew the attention of the Pinkerton National Detective Agency, mostly because of his tracking abilities. He was hired by the agency either in late 1889 or early 1890, and he was in charge of investigations in the Rocky Mountains of Colorado, Wyoming, and other western states, working primarily out of the Denver office. I know, we haven't got to Wyoming yet, but I promise we're getting there. Tom actually became known for his calm, under-pressure demeanor, as well as his ability to track down anyone assigned to him. Now, during the Johnson County War, Tom went to work for the Wyoming Stock Growers Association while he was still working for the Pinkertons. The Pinkertons had assigned him to work undercover using the alias Tom Hale. And it was alleged that while undercover, he was involved in the killing of Nate Champion and Nick Ray, and that he was the prime suspect in the killing of a couple of ranchers. So when this all came to light, the Pinkerton agency forced Tom to resign. There was a man named Charlie Seringo who worked for the Pinkertons who wrote, quote, William A. Pinkerton told me that Tom Horn was guilty of the crime, but that the his people could not allow him to go to prison while in their employ. So it seems like the Pinkertons knew what he had done, but probably because they told him to, but now he was a liability. So this man, Charlie, um, he also indicated that he had great respect for Tom's ability to track people and that he was very, very talented, but he had a wicked side to his personality. Now, while Tom's official title was range detective, it seems that he became more of a killer for hire. By the mid-1890s, the cattle business in Wyoming and Colorado was changing because of the arrival of homesteaders and new ranchers. The homesteaders moved into the territory in large numbers and they decreased the availability of water and grazing land for the herds of the larger cattle barons. And there were efforts made to get rid of the homesteaders, including hiring gunmen like Tom Horn. 
violent gunfights between the two sides precipitated the Colorado Range War, and of course, Tom was involved. In 1900, he began working for the Swan Land and Cattle Company in Northwest Colorado. And his first job was to investigate some rustling and a specific man named Matt Rash. Matt was the Browns Park Cattle Association leader, and it, he was suspected of rustling or stealing cattle. So Tom went undercover under the name Tom Hicks, and he went to work for Matt as a ranch hand, and he collected evidence that proved that Matt was branding cattle that did not belong to him. So when Tom had finally pieced together enough evidence to prove that Matt was indeed a cattle rustler, Tom, in his ways put a threatening letter on Matt's door telling him he had 60 days to leave the area. Well, Matt said, heck no, and he stayed and kept working his ranch. And so Tom's employers gave him the go-ahead. And one day, um, Tom arrived at Matt's cabin just as he finished eating and shot him at point-blank range. It is reported that, the, that Matt... Um, tried to write his the name of his killer, but there was actually no evidence of any, there was like the murderer left no evidence at all. There was um, lots of rumors though, and one of those people was a woman named Ann Bassett. She was engaged to marry Matt, and she actually um, named Tom Hicks, aka Tom Horn, as the murderer. But nobody saw him, okay? Nobody saw him do that. Um, so yeah, rumor, innuendo, um, there was also a period of time where Tom worked for the army again, and he went to Cuba as a packer, and while he was in Cuba, he, um, co contracted yellow fever, so once he re recovered, he, um, was determined unfit for combat, and he, so then he moved back to the United States and to Wyoming, and when he got to Wyoming, Tom began to work for John Cobble. Now, John Cobble was a cattle baron, and he belonged to the Wyoming Stockmen's Association. While working for John, um, Tom visited a um, family, Jim and Dora Miller family, and they were cattle ranchers. This is not the same Jim Miller, who was a Texas outlaw, it's a different man. Well, the Miller family had some new neighbors, the Nickel family. And Kells Nickel was a sheep rancher. And there had been some friction between the cattle and the sheep farmers in the area. <clears throat> so there was often accusations that um, Kells was grazing his sheep on the land that belonged to the cattle rancher. So T Tom was sent in to kind of mediate apparently. Now while, see I say mediate apparently because it doesn't seem like that's what the cattle ranchers association people wanted him to really do. What were they called? They were called the um, Wyoming Stockmen's Association. Supposedly they sent him in to mediate. So while Tom is in, he's in the Iron Mountain area, and he's there supposedly to mediate between the two, he meets Gwendolyn Kimmel. Now, Gwendolyn has been hired to be the teacher at the Iron Mountain School. And the only families with students in the Iron Mountain School are the Miller and Nickel families. And the two families paid for Gwendolyn to come and teach, but she was given a boarding status at the Miller's home. Before Gwendolyn came to cheat, teach she was told about the feud and was advised that this feud often played out in the children as well so tom's up here visiting the millers and he's meeting the school teacher and he's entertaining her with stories of his past and it seems like maybe there's a beginning of something going on here and later that day tom and the miller men went fishing now victor miller was um was one of the Miller boys. He was actually about Tom's age. And the two of them also went and did some um, t target shooting. They went practicing and both of them shot 30 30s. That's relevant. The only reason I put that in there is because that's relevant. 
Just a few days later, on July 18th, Willie Nickel, the 14-year-old son of sheep rancher Kells, was found murdered near their homestead gate. So, of course, a coroner's inquest begins to investigate their murder, and more violent incidents are occurring during this inquest. This inquest and the investigation into this violence went from July to September of, two, of 1901. Um, on August 4th, Kells was shot and wounded, and he, between 60 and 80 of his sheep were found dead. Now, two of the younger McNichol children reported seeing two men leaving on horses, and they were able to describe the horses. One was a bay and one was a gray, and these were horses that were recognized as belonging to Jim Miller. <clears throat> So, of course, on August 6th, the deputy sheriff and a deputy U.S. marshal named Joe LaFour were sent to Iron Mountain, and they arrested Jim Miller and his sons, Victor and Gus, of shooting um, Kells. They were put in jail, and on August 7th, they were re released on bond. So the investigation of the shooting of Kells was added to the investigation of his son Willie's murder in the coroner inquest. Now, this is August of 1901. In January of 1902, U.S. Marshal Lafour had a conversation with Tom about maybe coming to work for the Bar U.S. Marshal Service. Now, Tom was reportedly still very drunk from the day before, but the marshal claimed that in this conversation, he gained a confession from Tom to the murder of Willie Nickel. Allegedly, Tom confessed to killing the young Willie with his rifle from 300 yards, which he boasted as the, quote, best shot I ever made and the dirtiest trick that I had ever done. So, of course, Tom is arrested by the sheriff and the prosecutor in Laramie County. Another thing to just kind of um, chuckle about here, the judge um, presiding over the case was running for re-election. So Tom was supported by his friend and employer, John Cobble, the cattle rancher. John was able to gather a defense team headed by a former judge and included a number of well-known attorneys he reportedly paid most of the cost of this large team. But later, a man named Johan Baker wrote a book about the trial. And he found that um, the cattle interest, you know, that, that cattle company that John Cobble belonged to, that the 100 members of this Wyoming Stock Growers Association, they each paid $1,000 to War Tom's defense but they wanted a very minimal defense from the attorneys. Now, the only person who ever reported that was this author, Johan Baker, and it was never confirmed by anybody else. So just another piece to chew on. Tom's trial started a whole year later in October of 1902 in Cheyenne. The city was filled with people because Tom was famous or notorious anyway. And the prosecution um, introduced Tom's confession to the U.S. Marshal, but only parts of Tom's alleged confession. So this is obviously distorts the entire statement. Who knows what it, what he really said? The prosecution introduced a testimony by at least two witnesses, but they only managed to place Tom in the general vicinity of the crime. No one actually saw Tom there. During the trial, Victor Miller testified that he and Tom bought their ammunition at the same store. But hello, Victor also had the same weapon as Tom. Just saying. And probably everybody in town bought their ammunition there. There was another man who testified that Tom was 20 miles away from the scene of the murder about an hour after it was committed. Now, in a car, that's not a big deal. But walking or on horse, that's a whole day. So, eh, questionable. Gwendolyn, the school teacher... She actually had testified during the coroner's inquest, and her testimony said that she thought that both families were responsible for the main, maintaining of the feud, but they never called her as a defense witness. In fact, she had resigned from the school the October before and left the area, but was still in communication with people concerning the case. 
Tom's trial went to jury on October 23rd, and the next day he was found guilty. Um, several days later, he was sentenced to hang, sentenced to death by hanging. Of course, his attorneys filed a petition with the Wyoming Supreme Court for a new trial. And while in jail, Tom wrote his autobiography. In this autobiography, he talked very little about the actual case, just about his exploits. The Wyoming Supreme Court upheld the district court and denied a new trial. Convinced of Tom's innocence, Gwendolyn actually sent an affidavit to the governor with testimony stating that Victor was actually the one guilty of Willie's murder. Now, accounts of her statement appeared in the newspapers, but the original document disappeared, and the governor chose not to intervene in the case. So Tom was executed on November 20th of 1903, and he was one of the few people in the Wild West to have been hanged by water-powered gallows, known as the Julian Gallows. This was just another method concocted to hang a man without another man having to pull the lever. <clears throat> Tom was hanged in Cheyenne, and at the time of his death, Tom never gave up the names of those who had hired him during the feud. So he never said who belonged to this association that he was working for. He was actually buried in the Columbia Cemetery in Boulder, Colorado, so not in Wyoming, in December of 1903. Jim Cobble paid for his coffin and a stone marker for his grave. And after his death, many people considered him to have been wrongly executed based solely on a purported confession given when drunk that people believe should not have been admissible in court. <clears throat> With debate over Tom's guilt remained, I mean, it still is, is questionable. People still debate this. The consensus is that regardless of whether or not Tom committed that murder, he, and he admitted to having committed other murders, um, his, his confession was probably not really a confession, at least not a legally admissible one. Um, there was actually a mock trial in 1993, and Tom was acquitted. There is one writer, a man named Dean Crackle, and he believed that Tom was guilty, but he did not know he was shooting the boy. He thought maybe he was shooting the father. In 2014, a history professor from Arkansas State published um, Tom Horn in Life and Legend, and he his opinion is that Tom was responsible for the murder but he maintains that no evidence of a legal conspiracy was ever found against Tom and that Tom's, um, I don't know, less than legal methods of, of hindering crime, well, his brutality is actually what, com what contributed to his conviction of this crime. So, yeah, totally another one of those he said, she said, I don't even know how they managed to get a conviction, especially when um, a member of the opposing party had the same weapon and a greater motive. But also the cattle association or the, you know, whatever, the livestock association. Why did they want his attorney to not actually do a good job? Yeah, I, I don't understand that. I don't know, is it just me or is it that these old crimes just don't have enough? Um, I guess I'm kind of used to forensics, right? We, we have gotten so used to having um, ballistics and DNA and all kinds of other evidence that can definitively, definitively put a person at the scene of a crime that sometimes these older crimes seem like they are... Um, not necessarily handled properly but you know he did have a reputation of taking care of business and he took care of business so i don't know leave me a comment down below down below let me know what you think about this do you think that he actually killed the child he was convicted of killing so this is a picture of tom yeah he's a pretty dapper looking man i'm i'm just saying doesn't look like a wild and crazy man and this is a picture of the u.s marshal he looks a little bit more like a renegade than Tom does, to be honest. Thanks so much for hanging out with me today. I hope you enjoyed our 
final episode of season one of Crime and Coloring. Leave me a thumbs up. Leave me a comment down below. What would you like to hear? Um, watch one of these videos if you want more. Click to subscribe and have a really fantastic day.